So hello, everybody, and welcome to another in my little series of live discussions with business leaders here in New Zealand. I'm Rebecca Caro. I work in business to business marketing. And today I'm joined by Andy Hamilton. Andy, welcome. Hello, Rebecca. How are you? All good. Tell the listeners a little bit about yourself and your background in small, medium sized enterprise here. Yeah, so uh, my name is Andy Hamilton. I was the CEO of the Ice House for close to 20 years. Recently, I finished or retired from that role and got involved with supporting and found co-founding a support platform called Manaki. And I remain uh, on a board, on a few boards. I'm also a small business advisor to the Minister for Small Business and, you know, mentoring and other stuff that keeps me out of trouble, Rebecca. I can understand all of those things, keeping out of trouble and also having fun new projects is definitely what keeps me interested. So true. So true. Let's talk a bit about small, medium sized enterprise in New Zealand. So these are the businesses that you and I know extremely well. How are they coping now, day to day, as the lockdown rules are being imposed and changed? Look, I think. There was shock initially when it was like, wow, the economy, you know, this is bad and the economy's closing and I can't do can't do any revenue at all. Then people just kind of settled a bit. Uh, and then I kind of see it as, I think, two types, those that are in a lot of pain and they're in a lot of pain, tourism, hospo, uh, service providers, people who are just locked out of earning revenue. So there's that group. And then the other group, you know, they're doing fine. They've got enough uh, resources to wait it out or they're actually going quite well. But it's a have and a have not. And the have nots are struggling and, you know, maybe struggling for hope. I definitely empathise that. There have been some surprising winners out of the small cohort of businesses that I know quite well that when the back's to the wall and a requirement to very quickly change tack they've been incredibly skillful have literally jumped off cliffs not knowing you know what was going to be on on the other side or whether they would land softly or not and have had some surprising outcomes but the things that I've noticed the ones that have done well have felt capable of making very short-term decisions and mm. not too confused and understanding that the planning horizon is so immediate that a short-term decision can be reversed, but having the confidence to try something. And I expect in Monarchy is, has a forum where people can ask questions. You've probably seen that exact same thing happen with the sorts of questions that people have posted there. Yeah, look, the interesting thing with this is, is that if you've been through a recession before as a business owner, you know what to do you know to get your cost base under control straight away. You know uh, to continue to be a human for your staff, but you know not to avoid the reality and the truth that is, this is tough team, that we're gonna need to find a way to survive. For those that have never done that before, I think that's a really, really big challenge. If I look at the themes of the questions that came out of Monarchy, it started with how do I get access to government money? Yeah, that was the first thing. The second thing was, how do I negotiate with my landlord? Mm -hmm. Third was, right, what do I do with my staff? I've got, you know, on different terms, I've got part timers, full timers, can I keep them? Can I not? And then it started moving more recently into, right, I want to pivot. I want to go into digital. How do I how do I actually do that? How do I reach my end users? particularly when a lot of them are going through distributors, which I found really, really interesting. How do I do websites? You know, um, so it's kind of interesting to see how people react, but you can't replace. I didn't see that many experienced business owners looking in the headlights. I, I saw them just move quick. I definitely noticed from the marketing point of view that there are a very large number of marketers who've never seen a recession before. So I arrived in New Zealand in Christmas 2009. GFC was happening and I'm old and grey and I've actually been through three recessions from yeah. you know, when I left 
I left university straight into my first job and straight into my first recession. Um, and yeah. if you weren't in your current job 10 years ago, you have not seen a recession. Don't guess. Go and get some advice because there are some, as you say, reasonably straightforward principles that it's easy to learn. But if you don't know about them, timing is of the essence. And when you're trying to conserve cash flow, making a, a, a poor decision can cost a lot of money and potentially jobs. It's a hard thing too, though, because, you know, if you've done it before, you know you've got to get your cost base under control. At the same time, you, thinking about new markets, the thing that I find so amazing with experienced people who've been through this pain is that they can be both hard on their cost and then immediately be pivot and thinking, right, where can we go? How do we go? They kind of become a lot more short-term orientated. And I think that's just something for us to learn. Most of us don't know how to do that naturally. We have to learn. And we forget how to do it. You know, you get complacent yeah. in times of plenty and, and you get sharper yeah. in times of lean. Now, you hinted that some of the questions that are being asked are, you know, can we go digital? What could you, New Zealand do to become more of a digital business culture? Have you got any clues? Well, look, I think it's way more a science than it is an art. And that's something, you know, that I think when I just look at the algorithms that are required, whether that's on like the world like WeChat or the algorithms with Google or Facebook or do I go direct and how I organise that, I actually think it's incredibly complex if you've not been in it before. And I, you know, what I've observed is most owners know they need to go digital, but just want to go, how do I do it? Just mm -hmm. help me. Is it a Facebook page? And then it's like, well, yes, it is a Facebook page, but then you can't necessarily trade on there. So then you need a payment engine and then you need to link up. You know, I, I think it's really difficult, but it's a question I've got in this is, I think everyone agrees you have to find a way to build connection with your audience and your target market. And, and how you do that, I think, is foreign to a lot of people. Uh, that's quite interesting, given that they're in business and without customers, whether they're, you know, trade or, you know, members of the public, you ought to know how to sell. Is that the basic problem or is it actually that you're finding the digital interface and navigating that is the challenge that you don't know where to find your prospective customers? I just think that because it's digital, they start to question, well, they forget the, the discipline of what it is, which is in the end, you're just selling to someone else. Yeah. And so I think they just get a bit confused by that. And also, you can't see people digitally, like you, you can't see them. And so it may be that and it, they're just not used to it. I, and I do think that that's just, again, what do we know? Reach out yeah. to someone who's done it before find a consultant or a partner that you can work with and just start making steps or you know go it's amazing entrepreneurs other founders will help you if you're a founder and just say how did you do that and learn yeah i i definitely well, i've i've been in the digital world for a long time but regardless of that and well before i was in the digital world i have always found groups of people and the first group I found is a true story. I was a marketing manager in a big commercial real estate agency in London. And my equivalents in the competing firms, we would have lunch once a month and just share ideas because we were all friends. You might as well chat. There wasn't, weren't any big commercial trade secrets, you know, being addressed. Um, and, you know, I was probably the youngest of the three or four of us. But you ask good questions. You listen. And it's quite actually, it's easy to find groups nowadays, particularly online. Well, and, you know, as a mentor and advisor, one of the things I'm trying to be better at is when someone asks me a question, not giving the answer and instead saying, hmm, where could you go and find the answer to that? And because that's what I do. Whenever someone asks me a question, how do I get into foodstuffs? I go, who do I know yeah. that's done that before? And so if you if you put it back to them, say, look, there must be someone, you know, Scotty, who's um, one of my great friends, who's the founder of Blue Frog Breakfast. I, whenever I talk to him most weeks, I'm like, and he'll say, I'm trying to work out what the pricing is for Coles in Australia. I'm like, well, go into a Coles store or find out who else is in there and see if you can get to know them and ask them what they do. 
Just and ask a question. Yeah, people are surprisingly generous with information. You know, they they may choose to tell you their commercial terms. They might not, but they'll certainly tell you things like, um, you know, prompt payment discounts, which if you've never sold into a big enterprise like yeah. that, you know, these are ways that enterprises up their profits massively by giving themselves a discount by, for paying you within the terms that you set, you know. And when yeah. you know that things like that are potentially on the table, you're alert to them, they'll be in the small print. Yeah, so go and see what the real terms are. And I think that that philosophy for all of us is most things, there are answers to most of the questions we have in our mind. We just need to be open enough to go out and seek people who have dealt with that before. That doesn't mean they're telling you what to do. It means no. they're sharing with you what they did so you can work out what path you go down. And I have to be clear here that I actually think that's a very female approach to thinking. It's more collaborative yeah, than combative. And I think that digital is a better environment for collaboration than a traditional town market square where Andy's standing at one end going, apples, apples, and Rebecca's at the other one going, pears, pears. You know, that isn't how it needs to be because in digital, you can interact with a, a micro group of two or three people and the rest of the world doesn't need to know that you've even had that conversation. It's not that it's yeah. secret squirrel. It's just discreet. And that actually should give you confidence that mm, you can okay. learn like this. And you're not showing external signs of weakness and you're not going to get attacked for doing that. Yeah, part of it, I suppose, is for those of us who are owners who are trying to do digital, it's just quite good to know if I put stuff in here and then I get some reactions here and I fill my funnel here and I convert some you then start to go right I've got a model and then you can start to go let's keep doing more of that or let's spend a bit more money here lots of iteration I think is a really important and you know that as a marketing professional test iterate test iterate yeah. re recycle keep doing it now people who are watching live if you've got any comments or questions put them in the chat and I'll bring them up on screen so we can get your questions answered by Andy so based on what you were saying about people you know, beginning to find groups of potential customers online, do you think most firms in this migration to digital should consider having a direct-to-consumer channel? Yes, I think every firm should. And here's the thing that I've noticed, right? Um, so supermarkets are the digital, are, are the physical representation of a marketplace, right? Yep. Marketplaces online really um, grew through this COVID period where people like producers who were not getting their food service business started going, wow, we've got all this product, how are we going to sell? And so food box, harvest box, you know, a lot of these people started selling. Now, they are just the virtual representation of a supermarket. And I think you can't ever bet the farm on one. I, I find it obtuse to believe that you are not directly selling. I remember growing up with Massport and working for Massport and we weren't allowed to sell direct. Well, I, I think it's changed. I think in the end, you want to have a relationship with your end user. You may get a lot more business through channel, but having that direct connection, I think ultimately creates a better leverage because then you are truly connected with people who are using your product. It's a very good point you make. So one of my clients is a wholesaler of um, work gloves and safety equipment, and he deals through resellers, but he also knows his end users. And one of the things that, again, it's about building trust. If you're an end user, a client, and you come to him, he'll happily show you the product, but he will then direct you to the trade firm who will sell it to you. And yep. so he builds trust with his trade firms that he's not going to undercut them. He is going to funnel business to them. But, you know, that's a two-way street. And I think it's a confidence thing. I, I really think it's an important thing. And, again, I was dealing with a firm out, out of the middle of North Island last week who sells through distributors, and, and they didn't sell online. And I'm like, why don't you? And they said, well, we, we're a bit worried what our distributors would say. I said, well, that's a very good reason why you should because otherwise they're just going to hold tension over you. So I think, you know, it is difficult selling direct to the consumer and learning about all those algorithms and 
how you're optimizing the money and all of that. But yeah. often the reason you do it is not to make sales. It's to have the opportunity to engage with your end users of your products or services. And that actually is free market research. If you go, Andy, totally. how does it work? Do you like it? And you go, it would be better on my left hand if it did this or had a wear strip here or whatever. And that's a great way of, of building yeah. trust and feedback. And yeah. Hmm. So tell me, talk a little bit more about the type of distributors that you saw people working with and the sorts of industries. Because I remember seeing one monarchy question with someone explaining that there are a retailer of, of eco products and that they sell wholesale to, was it tourist shops? Where else are people finding wholesalers that they can work with? Part of that, if I look at, you know, we've had about uh, 65,000 people come to the Monarchy site. And interestingly, this is a really interesting stat. We've got a hundred to one ratio of people who come to the site to those that ask questions. That so we get a lot of, no, I know it doesn't surprise you, but it did surprise me at first. I was thinking, crikey, are we not doing well? But actually, no, lots of consumption of content. But I, I think I what I would say is most of the people coming and asking questions are in that direct-to-consumer, trying to build audience, yeah. trying to create connection. We've not seen that much um, uh, distributor stuff. I have observed a material shift away from suppliers who've gone, wow, well, my channels have all gone yep. through COVID. Now I need to build like, and, you know, we get now, what, you know, for six weeks, we didn't go to the supermarket. True. We got everything delivered. We, we're getting our lemons delivered from Gisborne. You know, I we're getting a food. From Northland, yep. Yeah. And I, I got to tell you, I, I don't mind paying more for that because I thought that there are no layers in between. And that is a direct relationship. I'm paying the courier fee, yeah. but, you know, it's going to the producer. And that's an interesting trend that we are seeing, which is this whole local thing. And I wonder now we get back, will we all go back to convenience and just go to the supermarket? But I think it's just quite interesting. What digital does is it collapses the value chain or supply chain? It certainly shifts it and shifts its emphasis. There was a Facebook group called Made in New Zealand that did phenomenally well with people who were, you know, New Zealand makers sharing with the audience and everybody who I knew who 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 got who was allowed to post into that group talked about a sales spike after they posted. So lots of people were definitely watching that. Over 400,000 members. Yeah. The, the other thing, though, I wanted to talk about was the supermarkets, because although we a lot of us didn't physically go there often, one of the things, mm. the challenges that I thought they managed superbly was afterwards, I was told that one third of meals eaten in New Zealand are from cafes or takeaways. So when cafes and takeaways were closed, the supermarket suddenly had a 30 percent hike in demand. And that was one of the reasons why it looked like they were short on their shelves, because actually I suspect the volumes were much, much higher. You told me that you have been in touch with some people who've been supplying supermarkets, new to supplying supermarkets in this period. What was their experience? I, I think uh, pretty good. I think, you know, um, the way that the supermarkets managed that demand expectation and that spike I can't quite remember, but I think it was February into early March. There was a massive spike in, on retail sales. And mm. I think they did deliverability did really well. I think some challenges with that model around payment of suppliers, and it was great to see, uh, especially foodstuffs, what they did around paying small suppliers on 10 days. I think oh, Countdown really? did it. Yeah, Countdown did as well, but it was way smaller businesses from what I understand. So I think that was really good. I just encouraged them to recognize that a small business supplying a supermarket doesn't have as strong a cash flow as a large business does. And, you know, I just hope that they extend those terms, payment terms, because that's actually good business for them. Because small businesses, you know, they don't have a lot. But in the end, most of their volume will come via the supermarket. So yeah. I think supermarkets have been good. Um, they're a really important part 
of our society because that's where most of us get you know our products but what will happen with all these other marketplaces and and that'll be interesting i suppose they're like many supermarkets really yeah i think resilience is the word that springs to mind when talking about that sort of supply chain if you've got very small micro producers um their capability of remaining resilient if your payment terms change is much less and I suspect yeah. that one of the big changes that the strategists in these larger firms will be looking at now is, you know, supply chain interruption. How do we deal with it? How do we cope? What are our alternatives? Don't put all your eggs in one basket type of thing. But actually testing that resilience and recognizing that actually small changes in things like your payment terms can have massive downstream effects and which brings me round to sort of questioning the model of capitalism that we're following. Because yeah. what you're saying, I think, is that this is not profit at all costs. This is actually a shift. Well, there's a couple of things there. The shift I talked about before around local and being local, I think, is, is real. Um, secondly, you know, what is reasonable? One of New Zealand's issues is our scale. And, and linked to scale is maybe domination and market shares of a small number of large organizations. And because we don't have that competitive market, I, I do have a question around how the benefits of scale are shared. And mm -hmm. I think of the power companies, the supermarkets, the banks and others. And I think with this trend of local, we might see some rise up from consumers saying, actually, I choose to, you know, purchase somewhere else. I choose to pay a higher amount. And actually, I choose to want to share the profit that is comes from my, you know, from me buying product with other people in the network. And that goes to this thing around profit at all counts. Um, I don't quite know how that will play out, but I think consumers want to have a choice. And that may push the boundaries a little. I think that's a good point. But don't forget there are other stakeholders. There are shareholders, there are suppliers, and there are members of staff. Now, those, mm. when you add them into what you've just said about consumers, I think you'll find that then there could be a quite a substantial shift. Obviously, shareholders are used to being heavily rewarded for investing their money with business, and no, nothing wrong with that. But employee turnover is a massive cost to industry. What if some of the profit investment was put mm. into things that helped employees to remain more loyal and to be less likely to change jobs, you know, on a whim? That's one thing. And then also considering, as you say, your long-term customer base how do you balance all those stakeholders is an answer that I don't have instantly to hand, but I think it's one of these pendulum swings. Yeah, and you know, um, shocks cause people to question how they do things ethically and otherwise and how they respond. And I, so I think when you have something like this, you know, I hope businesses and owners are going, right, well, what more could we do to protect our staff? Could we give them four day weeks? Could we let them work from home? Could we provide funding from micro credential training to give them more skills to help them to be more flexible you know could we support them with things like meditation or other i think there's a really interesting piece there that says how can we protect now actually m many small business owners are really good at looking after their staff i know at monarchy we just the owners of monarchy just sat there and said to each other right we've got to protect our staff what do we do for them and let's try and keep every single person employed on full pay for as long as possible. But we also had the chat that says, if things don't improve, we will have to go to 80% and then 50%. And, you know, I think I think you make a good point. And, but I always get worried that will just shift and revert, you know, back to oh, what it was. Never does. I mean, we're talking human nature here. But the other thing that flips into that, um, point about the profit element in capitalism. When I did my A level economics, we talked about profits and then super normal profits, which was, you know, oh, excessive yeah. high profits, which can be commanded. We all know. What if 
some businesses experimented with pay us the value that you perceive. Now, if you think me turning up and cleaning your bathroom for you is wonderful for whatever reason, yeah. and you pay what I or someone else might perceive as over the odds, does that matter? No, that's an easy exchange of value. It's you and me as two private individuals. But if you're a business and you're providing a service or a product, is there an element of the price which could be left to the consumer? Now, that might set different pricing expectations. And everyone knows New Zealanders love a bargain. And for me, I think actually that's one of the biggest things that hinders productivity um, and profit in this country is that we are too ready to discount and not ready enough to say, what's this worth to you? Rather than assuming that the price we have in our mind is actually the one that the other side might want to pay slightly less for. Yeah, you know, the couple of things that I think about and when you talk talk about that is um, there's something around courage and there's something around confidence. And I think New Zealanders can be a little bit unconfident about that. And maybe the other thing is not spending enough time thinking about the value that you deliver to the, your customer. Because I think that variable pricing is a really interesting thing, but most of us think we can't do that and that we have to we have to automate everything. And that's a control thesis that I don't know wholly works always. Give us an example. Well, it's I understand why you do it, why you have a control pricing, because that means all the layers in your organization know what to do. But if you if you said, team, let's just do this value based on basically what is the benefit that the customer gets. And we trust you and we back you. And if you end up with $2,000 and, and someone else 20,000, let's have a conversation about why that was. So we can all learn from that. But that's a way more disorganized model to take. And it's a trust-based model. I, I think it's really interesting because in the end, you know, what I observe is you only kind of need so much when you think about consumption, you only need so much and you always want to leave something on the table. But it's a high trust model and, and it's a, actually in high trust models, you need a lot of organisation and trust with people to enable it to happen. So perhaps it's better as a business to business application rather than a business Maybe. to consumer. But it would be well, an interesting project to test. Maybe we should go to Tasmania and try it there. What's wrong with Tasmania? Well, there's no, nothing. It's just a little isolated part of the world and no one would know that you were doing an A-B test there. Right in New Zealand first. <laughs> now, Andy, I want to ask you about the Small Business Council because this was something that was run for a year. It produced a report and you just told me that you're still part of a team that reports to ministers down in Wellington and to the civil service. I'm intrigued as a business person how can I influence government policy? Yeah, I think so. Th I think the report was delivered in September last year. And then about November, the minister and MB asked uh, four of the, so that the Small Business Council finished. And then they asked four of us on that council to continue on as small business advisors. And we've been working what's out, what is now six months now with them. And we had this, um, uh, basically an accountability regime, which was taking the recommendations from the Small Business Council report and then putting that into work programs. And then we're about to sign that off in February and there was a bunch of stuff. I think about six had already been done. COVID came. And so we, we've had what feels like three pivots in the last eight weeks as we've gone, let's roll that report out. No, stop. Let's have another think. No, let's stop. And if you look at some of the things, you've asked a question, how does small business engage? I think it's quite a difficult one. We feel we've been a little bit in a vacuum because we've been all hands on the pump helping MB think about things like the um, wage subsidy and responding when the minister would say, can you give us a view on this? I think um, in the past, the challenge with the small business engagement has been commitment and accountability to making change. And I think that last report was actually quite a good one. And I, I don't think it had, you know, maybe there's always three or four that will drop out in terms of recommendations. But I kind of feel we we are making progress. But 
the small business industry is so big and fragmented, it's hard to get a consistent voice. It's also hard to get a commitment to execution. What we learned from that process was, though, if you have small business owners together with people who are part of the sector plus government, I actually think it was a really, really good process. And the next phase, which will be, uh, I think there's going to be a fifth member adding, added that's not from that Small Business Council, will be really focused on a few key projects that will make a difference to small business, including digital and digitization, which is exciting. And is that program, that work program, likely to continue regardless of who the next government is? Well, that's always, you know, my wife was just asking me before, she said, well, do you continue on when the new government comes in, if there is a new government or a new minister? But who knows? We, we are all, we don't do it for jobs. We do it for to serve small business because we love small business. I, I hope so. I think the other thing that we need to do and what MB needs to do is publish the work programme so that, you know, people can see on LinkedIn and can see actually here's a bunch of stuff that's going on and and provide a voice on that. And we're certainly encouraging the minister and MB to be more vocal. But through COVID, there was just a, uh, yeah. a control of messaging, you know, which was around the health stuff. So I think how to find that forum to engage, and maybe when we're all um, seeing each other physically again, there may be an opportunity to reach out uh, with, you know, maybe the minister going on tour. That could be fun. I'd definitely sign me up for um, either a visit, a seat to watch or a, as an interviewee uh, to um, you know talk to Stuart Nash. I'd love to. One of the things that I think is an interesting um, principle that might be beneficial is transparency. Yeah. Putting out more information than people have the capability to absorb is um, uh, often it sounds like a, a lot of work, but actually you will find that people who are keeping an eye on things potentially journalists who have, you know, powerful followings on, you know, news websites and social media. They are the sorts of people who will pick up on some of these things. And one of the things that I noticed happening in other countries, particularly France, where as COVID-19 happened, the French government opened a conversation, a digital conversation on a website that said, here are seven concepts for the future economy of France. What do you, the people, think? And they just invited public feedback on these seven, they were all gigantic work streams. I wouldn't have wanted to implement any of them. But in terms of taking the pulse of the nation at a critical time, it was a very yeah. interesting exercise. And I you think could one of, see the themes. Yeah. You know? I think one of the things that we've learned through this as small business advisors is that we weren't as open around what was happening. You know, like from February, I, I think I was two to three days a week supporting MB, as were a couple of our other small business advisors, doing all this work, you know, looking at all of the responses that the OECD countries were doing, yeah. trying to translate that, trying to think about, you know, what would make a difference to small business. But we did that in isolation and we didn't share that. And I think that that's a mistake that we made and that transparency, the radical transparency, I think is a really important thing to do and to continue. And that's something that I think I need to take on board so that people also can say, ah, oh, you know, I agree, or why is this not on the list? And I think that's just something that we could all do better. Well, Andy, I look forward to seeing the outcomes of that. I'll continue following you online. In the week. <laughs> so for, for listeners who want to connect with Andy, tell people where they can find you. Yeah, so you can get me uh, on LinkedIn, Andy Hamilton. You can also get me at monarchy.io. Love you to ask any questions that you do have, any challenges or opportunities. I'm the moderator on monarchy.io, so I get to approve all of the questions or otherwise and also filter them to the experts as well. Uh, and you can just – I think LinkedIn's a good place to get me, Rebecca. Cool. And for me as well, of course, I'm on LinkedIn and my blog is Creative Agency Secrets, and I'm writing a lot of – short video articles about little things that you might want to do today with regards to your marketing in this time of change. Andy, thank you. It's been a pleasure. And uh, thank you to everyone who's been listening. I will publish this. And so you'll be able to watch it again if you came in halfway through. Till next time. Goodbye. <laughs>